Hey everybody, Randy Sullivan here with Bourbon Real Talk. Who's the most interesting woman in whiskey? Well, you're in luck. We're about to go talk to her, so stick around. So here we are with the most interesting woman in whiskey. Are you comfortable with that title? Yeah. <laughs> This is Sherry, uh, currently with Uncle Nearest. Tell the people, like, when did you get started in whiskey? I started in the industry in 1975. I needed money to go to college, and so my great-grandmother I wanted me to live with her, and I said, well, I need a job, and I need money. Mm -hmm. So uh, she told me I could come live with her, and she was already connected with Jack Daniels. So the next day they gave me a call and I had a job. So right. that's how I started summers and weekends at Jack Daniels. And so one of the things, like, I don't know if people understand, like there is whiskey royalty in the United States, right? The, the Russell's family, the Beams, obviously, probably the first family of bourbon. Uh, but there's that same sort of rich history in Tennessee whiskey around Lynchburg, Tennessee, and Jack Daniels. And everybody knows Jack Daniels, and but Jack Daniels actually wasn't that huge of a whiskey company when it shut down for Prohibition. It really got big under Lim Motlow, yes. Jack Daniels' nephew, who took over and resurrected the distillery after Prohibition. And who is Lim Motlow to you? He was my uncle. He'd been a great uncle. And I'm very proud of him because what I like is he came back after Prohibition. Mm -hmm. And when people think about a business being shut down for that many years, equipment not working, and to come back. So one of the things he had to do, because uh, Lynchburg was a dry county, mm -hmm. he knew he could not get him to vote wet. So he got himself elected to the state senate and got the law changed that you could make whiskey in a dry county. Right. So his first thing was to get the laws changed. Then he started uh, bringing back the distillery. The other thing that I'm very proud is he kept the uh, Lincoln County process, mm -hmm. charcoal melon. Mm -hmm. And a lot of places were still were doing that before Prohibition, but after Prohibition, he was the only one that kept that step wow. in the process. Wow. Now you mentioned that you um, that you were going to live with your grandmother. Who, who was your grandmother? My great grandmother was Mary Bobo. So I, I grew up around whiskey and good food. Yeah. So I mean, it's not a bad life at all. So, so for those of you who don't know, if you go to Jack Daniels, it, it doesn't matter what tour guide or your friend that loves Jack Daniels. If you say, "Where do I eat when I'm in Lynchburg?" Lynchburg there is only one answer, and it's Miss Mary Bubbos. Miss Mary Bubbos. And, um, and, and so you actually lived there, and you worked there for a little bit when you were a kid, right? Yes, yes. You know, I would try to get up and uh, do the tables. One of the things she did is she always kept a family table. That was part of her contract. The mm -hmm. other thing that's kind of fun about her is at 88, she signed a contract with Jack Daniels to serve meals. So her last 14 years were her most profitable. She well, lived to be 102. So 102. <laughs> And was making out menus, getting her people schedules. So I had a good role model. So, yeah, I don't know what. I, I'm going to go to at least 105. At least. <laughs> at least. She's, how old are you now, 63? 64. 64. And she's just hitting her stride. Just hitting my stride. Yeah, she's just picking up speed. Y'all yeah. better look out because good things are coming. <laughs> so one of the things that I find interesting about the, the world of whiskey is that, you know, there are those, the, the upfront positions, yes. the master distiller, the master blender. Um, everybody knows those people. Yeah. Um, but you know that it takes a lot of the behind the scenes people to really make everything work. And sometimes those people aren't as well known. And that's what made me so interested in you because you've played some very important roles at Jack Daniels. Is that, is that fair to say? I think so. What was your title at Jack Daniels when you retired? When I retired, I was director of whiskey operations and assistant vice president. So I had the distillery, charcoal mellowing, uh, sawmill, get rid of the slop. I had processing, warehouse, and environmental and quality control for both areas. So my finger was just, uh, you know, on the whiskey, all the process. And to your point... The world needs some nerds in the background. Sure. There is just some nerdy stuff. Now, when I was at Jack, if you asked me what were the barrels like on April 15th, 1988, 
I could pull out and say we had this many wormholes. Right. We had this many leaks at the crows. Because all that information, you you gather a lot of data because you don't know how important it's going to be. Sure. And you find out it's an interaction on uh, your yield and your maturation, the quality of your barrels. Right. So, but, you know, it takes a nerd that wants to keep up with that kind of stuff. Right, right. And and it, just to put it in perspective, I mean, right now, most of the bourbon nerds are super into Buffalo Trace products, right? Um, Buffalo Trace is small compared to Jack Daniels. So Jack Daniels is the second largest whiskey producer on planet Earth next to um, the Scotch. What is it? Yeah. Johnny Walker? Johnny Walker. And Johnny Walker is only a little yeah. bit bigger, about 10% bigger. And so you right now are looking at the woman that grew it from what it was in 1975 to what it is today, the second largest whiskey company on planet Earth. And a lot of people don't even know the the, the work that went into all no, of that. No. And that's why I find you so interesting. Your job was to process improvement, yes. to increase yields, increase production and all that stuff. What were some of the, the projects that you worked on when you were Well, uh, I did, Sarah, for one, was on barrel yield optimization, uh -huh. is how to get more yield out of that barrel. Uh -huh. And then also taking our existing warehouses, and as we were getting ready to do construction, is can we utilize more space in the warehouses? Right. So we had a project, it was called the Buzzer's Roost, and I'm and I, not that creative. It just turned out that some of the guys had talked about in the 50s, they were running out of space, and they started putting some uh, loose boards up on the peak on the seventh floor of the right. warehouses. So I decided to try it, and we put it up there, worked with Matt Manufacturing. You know, because those kind of changes take a lot of nerdy work. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had to get a piece of equipment that would go up four tiers because they're designed for three tiers. So now we need a piece of equipment that could go up higher. Mm -hmm. So we did that one, and then we did one called Extender Rig. And the reason that one is funny is the so one <laughs> the, well i'm gonna she won't say it but i'm gonna i'm gonna tell, i'm gonna tell you just so that you know so she does the whole extender brick project and she's got people coming in from france to like look around at things and she finds out that all of the distillery workers have been calling it the the extended dick project <laughs> And so, so when she told me, she, she was like, I wish somebody would have helped me with these, naming these projects because I, I know. I just, you, you can tell I'm a nerdy country girl because I did not put, <laughs> and this project ended up being like a, a over $30 million cost savings. Right. And the only names I had were Extender Rick. Uh, one, two, three, and buzzer trues. You yeah. know, somebody else, a marketing person, would have come up with a lot better, better names. So the buzzer trues actually became the 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 starting point for of single barrel for, of the single barrel program. So if you think about it, when they are building the buildings, they have to have a pitch to the roof so that you know rain and snow will come off. But they didn't have barrels in that space, and that was wasted space. And you're the efficiency expert, yes. so you have to figure out a way to construct additional rick space up there yes. and get equipment that can get barrels up there because it was you didn't have anything that went that right. high. But and we that, had to take out in ergonomic and safety measures for the men. So, sure. I mean, it was a big project. Big project. And up high is where the heat is. Mm -hmm. And so the barrels age a little bit differently up yes. there. And that is now where Jack Daniels single barrels come yes. from is the buzzard's roost. The buzzard's roost. And, you know, it wasn't an overnight thing because you already always has to test. Mm -hmm. So we started with some test rigs to see how is it going to age. Mm -hmm. Is it going to hurt the third tier? What's mm -hmm. it going to do going to the fourth tier? So it wasn't like an overnight thing because you've got to test. That's the one thing that I see, too, in the industry sometimes is people just want to prove what they want. Mm -hmm. And you really have to set up an experiment with controls and test it and monitor it to, to see, are you gonna hurt anything? Hey there, Bourbon Real Talk listeners and watchers. Randy Sullivan here. Wanted to take a quick break to tell you how you can support the channel. We've had a lot of people that have come into the Bourbon Real Talk family lately and we're grateful for every one of you. But unlike a lot of other channels, we don't have a Patreon and I don't allow anyone to sponsor the show. So what I do have though is some merchandise. We have Bourbon Real Talk hats. We've got Bourbon Real Talk t-shirts. Very soft, high quality. We also have 
Whiskey Wife t-shirts for the long-suffering significant others in our lives. We have full-size Glens for when you need an official whiskey tasting experience. We have Wee Glens for when, you know, you want to drink a little bit less, maybe try a few extra samples. We have insulated tumblers for when you want to drink incognito. We have full-size Glen lanyards for when you need hands-free access at a bottle share. We've got candles, including charcoal and tonka, leather, and Cuban cigar. We have one and two ounce whiskey sample storage boxes. And of course, we have the American Whiskey Aroma Kit for when you want to step your whiskey game up and be able to break a whiskey down to its components. If you saw any of this stuff, you want to support the channel, you can head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick something up. But if you just want to hang out here and learn, I'm totally happy with that as well. Just happy to have you as a listener. Well, you retired from Jack Daniels. Yes, and, I did. Um, but, but here you are working. Where are, you, uh, where are you working at now? I am now with Uncle Nearest. Okay. So I had retired, and I did nothing for a year, but... People don't like to hear doing nothing, so I said I was on a sabbatical. Yeah. And people give you respect when you're on, on a sabbatical. sabbatical. So right. I took a sabbatical. Yeah. And then I got into real estate. My son's had a concrete company. And then I ended up just kind of focusing on real estate. So our article came out in June of 2016. And it was about Uncle Nearest. Mm-hmm. And Jack Daniels, who released it for their 150th anniversary, and it, that he was... Uh, the first master distiller for uh, Jack Daniels. Well, that was in June of 2016, and the founders of the company, Keith and Fawn Weaver, were in Lynchburg in uh, the end of August. Mm -hmm. Well, my cousin, Lynchburg's a small town, so we still get excited when people from California are there. Right, right. (laughs) Now, if they're on tour, it's fine, but if they stay over that. So the librarian calls my cousin, who is Lem Motlow's granddaughter, and says, there's people here from California researching uh, the Green family and your family. So my cousin goes over to the library and meets them and told them that the Dan Call Farm, where the first whiskey was made and where Uncle Nearest was for sale. And she said, and my cousin is a real estate agent, and she knows the Green family. Okay. So that's how I met the Weavers on their second day here. And I was a real estate agent that was used to purchase the property. Mm. And so they were going to write a book, had nothing to do with whiskey, just got that connection through my cousin. And then about three months later, they're going, we're going to start a whiskey company. And I go, oh, okay. <laughs> do you know what I did? <laughs> <laughs> so the, one of the jokes is when they first started, they said, well, who, are you gonna, who do you have that ha- that's going to help on the whiskey? And they go, oh, we're just going to use a real estate agent. And they go, <laughs> don't you have some? You're like, are you crazy? <laughs> and they go, well, she just so happened she retired from Jack Daniels after 31 years right, and right. director of whiskey operations. Well, it, it, a lot of people people don't know about the the history of Uncle Nearest and its connection to Jack Daniels. Ben Green had written a book in the 60s about Mm. the legacy of Jack Daniels and so so glad he did that because a lot of this is all oral history you're Mm. not going to find it but it got recorded and Lamp Woods was in quoted in that book and so that was the point where Fawn started doing her research Mm. is off that book. Well, I'm very excited about the future of Uncle Nearest. Yes. I'm very excited about uh, the opportunity. I don't know if you would agree to this, but I would love it since you are filled with 31 years of stories from the <laughs> second largest whiskey company in the world. If next time I come to Tennessee, you'll come back on and we can do a story time with Sherry. Yes, series. yes. Okay. Yeah, I've got a lot of stories. Yeah, yeah. All right, so support Uncle Nearest um, because you guys are working on great things and helping... To bring awareness yes. of, you know, that whiskey is not, it doesn't lack the diversity historically as a lot of people would assume. So if this is your first time watching the channel, I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Our channel philosophy is about bringing people together around brown spirits. And I find that whiskey has a connective power like no other. And connecting people to each other is important to me because unfortunately I did lose my brother to suicide in 2014. And it made me realize that there are people all around that could fill you know, alone, they don't feel loved, they don't feel connected. And since whiskey has that power, I thought, well, maybe I can make a channel that gets people connected to whiskey 
And then the whiskey will do the job for me and get people connected to each other. So that's part of the impetus for this channel. Um, I'll also say that I've seen, especially lately, a lot of hate being shown to each other online over political differences or whatever. It could be religious, whatever it is. And the way I see it is that if somebody can hate you for something that you said online and they don't really know you, it's just as easy for me to love <laughs> you, even though I don't really know you, okay? And that's why I end every podcast the same way, and that's this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Cheers. Uh, I work for him at Brown Foreman. Well, and I don't know if y'all know him, but he's the one that started Kentucky mm -hmm. Distillery. And the first visit I made to him, I was helping somebody with a vodka uh, project before I came back with Uncle Nearest. And I said, Steve, this is great. You're starting a distillery. And he goes, I'm the stupidest son of a in the whole crap distillery. <laughs> and I go, why? I said, you're brilliant. He goes, no, I know what it takes and how much money it takes to do a and distillery. I'm and I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> He said, most people go into it and they go, oh, shit. he said, but I went into it no knowing. Right. Stuff, so.